Hello and welcome to our second mini lecture for chapter 5. In this mini lecture we will be covering sections 5.5 through 5.8 which covers telescopes that work outside of the optical or visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The reason that astronomers want to look at other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum is that we can get drastically different views of the same object uh, by going to different parts of the spectrum. Different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum come from different processes and so we can get very different information. For example, here are several pictures of the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is the remains of a star that exploded in July of 1054, so not quite a thousand years ago. And here you can see several pictures of the Crab Nebula taken through many different wavelengths of light. We will start on the upper right this is a picture of the Crab Nebula taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is visible light. And you can see these thin filaments that are the remains of uh, the star that exploded. And that little blue glow across the center, that is uh, gas heated up by the neutron star, the pulsar, at the middle of the nebula. And we'll be talking about these in just a couple more weeks. If we go to infrared radiation, so this is wavelengths longer than visible light, the nebula looks fairly similar. We still see a lot of the filaments, we still see the big gas in the middle, uh, but the sizes are slightly different and some of the thinner optical filaments aren't visible in the infrared. If we go to radio waves, we see that the brightest parts of the nebula are now that center region, which are some of the faintest parts in the visible light, and that the outer filamentary structure, while still there, is a lot fainter. If we go to higher energies, such as ultraviolet light, here we see that the outer parts of the nebula that we saw in the infrared and the visible light are barely visible, and most of what we see is a bright spot at the center. Moving on to x-rays, all that we really see is that bright area at the center, and this is the area that is being heated by the neutron star, since neutron stars are very active and very hot. And finally, if we go to high energy x-rays and gamma rays, we don't see much of anything, and that's because these telescopes have trouble focusing light. We're not able to see much detail, but still we think that most of the light we're seeing is coming from the neutron star at the very center. Telescopes that are outside of the optical region of the electromagnetic spectrum have drastically different designs. Here in the upper left, we have a, an early radio telescope. Uh, in the lower region of the screen, we have a radio telescope that looks at very long wavelengths of light. And these are just a bunch of radio antennas stuck out in a field. They have to move the antennas now and then to uh, mow the field and uh, make hay. And then in the upper right, we see a gamma ray telescope. And in none of these do you see anything that looks like a mirror. Um, there is very little that looks like you might think a traditional telescope should look like. And that's because in order to collect these different wavelengths of light, we need to have drastically different telescope designs. So let's start at the lowest energy electromagnetic waves and move up to high energy. We'll start with radio light since radio waves are the lowest energy on the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, there are two types of radio telescopes. Uh, these are single dish radio telescopes. That means that there's a, a bowl that acts like the mirror and there's just one of them. And uh, these tend to be very large telescopes. The one on the left is the Green Bank Telescope. It's in the mountains of Green Bank, West Virginia. And it is the world's largest steerable radio telescope, meaning it can point anywhere on the sky. And it has a diameter of 100 meters. Uh, compare that to the largest diameter of optical telescopes, which is 10 meters. And uh, you can see this is a huge structure. On the right is the world's largest radio telescope. It's called the Arecibo Radio Telescope. It's in Puerto Rico. You may have seen this telescope in movies like uh, James Bond and Goldeneye, where this dish rises up out of some pond. In fact, there's no lake here. That's all CGI. But still, uh, James Bond had to run along 
all of these uh, ropes and, and down the dish and it's 305 meters across. This is built in a valley between uh, some small hills and it's so large that it can't be moved so there's a very limited part of the sky that it can look at. There are also radio observatories that use multiple radio telescopes. Uh, here on the left is a picture of the very large array which is in Socorro, New Mexico. This array has 27 radio telescopes, each of them 25 meters across, and they can be moved different distances apart up to a distance of 22 and a third miles from the end of one arm to the end of another arm. If you've seen the movie Contact with uh, Jodie Foster playing the lead role, uh, she sits at a car listening to the signals from these telescopes in her headphones. In reality, you can't do that. These are not radio waves like your radio would pick up, uh, but it makes for good movies. And on the right, we see a schematic of the world's largest radio observatory called the Very Long Baseline Array. You see we astronomers have very creative names for these observatories. This array consists of 10 radio dishes uh, that range all the way from Puerto Rico through Texas and out to Hawaii and so it stretches 5,000 miles across. Now why would we want to use multiple dishes? It has to do with the resolution of a telescope. We talked briefly about the resolution in mini lecture one. Larger telescopes can see sharper images and that holds across the electromagnetic spectrum but there's a little more to it than that. To get a sharp image not only do you need a large telescope but you need to consider the wavelength of light that you're using. The smallest thing you can see through a given telescope can be calculated with this equation and I'm not going to ask you to use the equation but let's just look at it for a minute. So angle that's the theta on the left that's the uh, smallest the size of the smallest thing you can see and that is equal to 250 times the wavelength of light divided by the diameter of the telescope. So the longer the wavelength of light, the larger the smallest thing you can see is. In other words, the longer the wavelength of light, the less sharply your telescope can see. And then as we already learned, the larger the diameter of the telescope, the smaller you can see. So if you hook a bunch of telescopes together, such as these 27 radio dishes, you can use clever computing techniques to see an image as sharp as if you had a single telescope of the diameter of the, all the distances between the dishes. This is a process called interferometry. So for example, in the radio telescope uh, in New Mexico, even though each dish is only 50 meters across, the entire telescope acts like a single telescope with a diameter of 22 miles. So it can see very sharp images, much sharper than most telescopes, most optical light telescopes can. However, uh, it doesn't collect as much light as a telescope 22 miles across, so therefore it's limited in how faint it can see. So it can see very sharp, but it can't see very faint. Here's an example of uh, why we use interferometry in radio and it just uses this angular resolution equation that we looked at. So with your eye, uh, sort of in typical light, your pupil has a diameter of two millimeters. The wavelength of the light that we're looking at is 500 nanometers. That's green light, about the size of a bacterium. And the resolution of the eye, the smallest thing you can see, is one arc minute, or 60 arc seconds. Remember, one arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. If you go to a small telescope, uh, the, the middle picture here is of our telescope we have at the Commerce Observatory. It looks at the same optical light, but it's much larger. It has a diameter of 370 millimeters, and so its theoretical resolution is about a third of an arc second. However, the atmosphere blurs um, the scene of this telescope to one or two arc seconds, so uh, already by the time you get to a small research telescope um, 16 inches across, you um, you already are limited by the atmosphere, not by how big the telescope is. The Hubble telescope, its diameter is 2.4 meters, so that's 2,400 millimeters, 
and if you calculate its resolution it can see to 0 0.05 arc seconds and since it's above the blurring atmosphere the Hubble telescope actually can see that sharp so the best optical pictures that we have in current astronomy come from the Hubble telescope precisely because it's above the atmosphere and can reach this theoretical limit now if we look on the right we can see some radio telescopes at the top there's that green bank telescope that its diameter was um, 100 meters and we'll assume that it looks at the wavelength of light of 21 centimeters that's a common radio wavelength to look at uh, its resolution is 180 arc seconds so in other words even though this dish is a hundred meters across it is three times worse than your eye at seeing the sharpness of objects so that's not very good uh, but we can't build radio telescopes a single dish any larger than Arecibo so that's why we go to this interferometry the a very large array out in the desert of New Mexico uh, when it's at its largest configuration its diameter is 36 kilometers and that gets it a resolution of 1.4 arc seconds so in other words this telescope system that's 22 miles across can only see as sharp as a small optical telescope that's due just to the fact that the wavelength of the light is so much longer the very long baseline array with it being 5,000 kilometers across it can get to a resolution of one hundredth of an arc second or better than the Hubble telescope so this is why radio astronomers like to use this interferometry